So here's Jesus. He is standing on the other side of the tombstone. I honestly have never thought of where we got that word before until I wrote that sentence earlier this week. Tombstone. Jesus is standing on the other side of the tombstone. He's standing on the outside, looking in. I wonder what he was thinking as he stood there, knowing what was coming. In these three years of ministry, this miracle, this miracle in John 11, is really the miracle to top all miracles. It's the main event. I mean, the feeding of the 5,000, that was incredible. Walking on the water was spectacular. The healing of the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda, the healing of the man who was born blind, the calming of the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the woman who was bleeding, reached out to touch Jesus' garments, the healing of the ten men afflicted with leprosy, so, so many more. Those, those just really scratched the surface. But out of all of those amazing Jesus miracles, this one, this one really stands out. Here, Outside the tomb of Lazarus, the power and the glory of God through Jesus. It's on full display now. There's nothing held back here. And this miracle, this one is personal to Jesus. Lazarus is his friend. In fact, Lazarus and his two sisters, they're all friends of Jesus, so much so that when Lazarus becomes ill, the sisters send a message to Jesus to let him know. Lazarus and his two sisters are in Bethany. It's a, a small village outside of the Mount of Olives, just outside the city of Jerusalem, really, two kilometers away. It's actually right along what we are hearing of every day right now in the news, right along the Gaza Strip. It's just a couple of kilometers outside Jerusalem. But Jesus, Jesus and his disciples have left that area. They've traveled on across the Jordan River because there have been threats of violence against him. And I like today, when we, when we read that the sisters sent Jesus a message to let him know that his friend Lazarus was sick, even if it's not intentional, our minds cannot help but automatically translate this into our own forms, our own patterns, our own behaviors of communication, a phone call. A text. If you think of a similar situation today where texts are sent out with every slight change in condition, when a doctor is called in, when, what procedures are taking place, if the temperature happens to go up or down, or the blood pressure goes up or down, or if they're taking x rays or a CAT scan or medications, a specialist is called in, but no. These were the days before texts and before cell phones. If you can remember back this far, these were the days before snail mail. Someone had to travel on foot to deliver the message that Lazarus, Jesus' friend, was ill. So we know that the recipients of this news, that we know that those who received the news, Jesus and his disciples, understood that the condition <coughs> was very serious. Because you don't send a messenger to tell them that someone has been told. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't apparently throw a few things together. 
together, put them in the bed, and set out on the journey on the road to Bethany. But he stays where he is for two extra days, two additional days before coming home. So that when he finally arrives in Bethany, Jesus, uh, Lazarus is not just dead, but Lazarus is four days dead. He is four days dead. And it's, that's important if you are considering this miracle alongside some of the other miracles that we read about in Scripture. Because this is not the first time that Jesus has raised someone from the dead. There was Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son. But both of those were so freshly dead that Jesus says that they are just sleeping. Which is what he says initially also about Lazarus, maybe not to alarm the disciples, but then finally the truth comes out. He is not sleeping, he is dead. But not Lazarus. Lazarus is not freshly dead, he is four days dead. And Jesus has deliberately, deliberately, it's hard to understand, but he has deliberately delayed his arrival so that there could be no doubt, there could be no uncertainty, there could be no plausible explanation, there could be no skepticism, no disbelief, there could be no alternative explanation. Only God could pull out a miracle like this one. Lazarus, four days dead, now walking out of the tomb, very much alive. Author David Lowe writes about this story. He says, As most of us learned years ago in high school, English composition class, verbs are what make stories work. While character development matters, it's the verbs, the parts of speech that describe what actually happens to the characters that move the story forward. Further, he writes, good verbs invite us into the story. By rendering the action of the narrative vividly and completely, verbs create space not just for us to watch, but actually and sympathetically to participate in what was happening before us. And this is a story that is full of powerful verbs that literally bring the story to life. In a piece that he calls the story of Lazarus in four verbs, Lois calls our attention, you guessed it, to four verbs that help the story to take shape. The first one is tarried, but in our Bibles it might be to stay, stay, to weep, come, as in come out, and unbind. Those are the ones that most draws our attention to. And I, I think that we would all agree that those verbs do help to carry the story alive, help it make it come alive. But in the shadow of that great, spectacular miracle, Lazarus coming out, being unbound, in the shadow of that miracle, there is this other verb. It gets completely lost, completely overlooked. So if I was giving it a title, I might call it The Story of Lazarus in Four Letters. Because while we are so <coughs> focused on the unbelievable and impossible, made possible, Lazarus, this miracle of him being raised from the dead, we fail to notice this thread that is running through the story, right from the beginning to the very end. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And if you look at the story, 
That love is woven through from start to finish. At the beginning, Mary and Martha sent word about Lazarus to Jesus. In verse 3, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And it's there again in verse 5. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in that place where he was. And then again in verse 34, Jesus said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. And so the Jews said, See how he loved him. Love is this thread embroidered beautifully throughout the story from start to finish. We catch just glimpses of it, but we are looking for that big event. Love is expressed powerfully in Jesus' conversations with Martha and Mary, and then later with the crowd who has come out to see what's about to happen, and with the Father through prayer. And though Jesus never says those words, I love you, he embodies love in listening, in reassuring, in being present with them, in offering them hope, in weeping with them. Chelsea Herman points out that this love is not just a threat, it's not just an element of great storytelling. She offers this insight. She says this phrase in verse 5, Though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, she says it's not so much a narrative pivot point as it is an anchor point. No matter what happens next, we can come back to that knowledge that Jesus loves them. It was not a lack of love that kept him away, nor was it a lack of love that led to Lazarus dying. God's glory does not cancel out God's love. Jesus knows what is to come, and he loves them. That's what we know. It's what we see even though he knows how this story will end. He expresses his genuine love for his friends, joining them in their suffering. I think that's such a helpful lens for us to see this story through. Love is not a narrative pivot point in the story. It's not a plot twist that we didn't see coming. Because unlike the very large majority of miracles, which are shared with us throughout Scripture, they are just people that Jesus met along the way, that he had really no prior human knowledge of, maybe supernatural knowledge of, but they're just folks that he met on the road or in a town where he was visiting. That would be a narrative pivot point. But these, these are people he knew. These were his friends. That would be the pivot. First, they were strangers that he met along the way. But these, these were his friends. They were people that he loved. But what Herman so helpfully illustrates is that that love is not just that pivot point, that personal friendship relationship he had, but that that love is an anchor. And I want to say yes, that love is what anchors, it's not the story, but it anchors the whole experience. And because Jesus' love is an anchor in this story, it's not as Herman writes, that whatever happens, we, the readers of the story, can come back to that knowledge that, that we can kind of exhale that Jesus loves them. 
that somehow there's a tension in the story that has to resolve itself. Much more importantly, no matter what happens next in the story, Mary and Martha and Lazarus can come back and rest in that knowledge. They know that Jesus loves them. That no matter what happened, they know that Jesus loves them. That is the anchor that they are holding on to. And by the end of the story, we see and we know that the power of death is no match for the power of love. And just in a few more chapters, we would see that in love, Jesus chooses to trade places with Lazarus. In love, Jesus chooses to trade places with Lazarus. That's when we begin to see everything kind of click into place. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Jesus loved you and me. He loves our neighbors and our co-workers and our friends and our quirky family members. He loves the lonely and he loves the social butterfly and he loves the poor and the weak and he loves the successful and the worried. He loves the stranger. He loves the sick. He loves our neighbor. He loves the people who are hard to love. You get that idea. So it shouldn't surprise us that this love story, the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Jesus, is found in the Gospel of John. John, whose Gospel includes the words, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. John, whose gospel includes the words, and I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. John, whose gospel includes the words, and as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Again again and again. Love is this thread running all the way through the Gospel of John, right to the very, very end. The story of the risen Jesus, now on the other side of the tombstone again, asking Peter. Peter, who outside the courthouse denied even knowing Jesus, just before his crucifixion. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times. John would use the word love 39 times in his gospel. And in his very short letter, back to our Bible's first John, he uses the word love 26 times. So just to give you a little bit of a comparison, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in those three Gospels all together, only use the word love a total of 27 times. So that gives us a sense of the impact of not just Jesus teaching on love, but the impact of how Jesus loved and shaped the rest of John's life. And that love, the love of God, is not just expressed here in the Gospel of John, but it is demonstrated over and over again, right from those very opening words in the book of Genesis, when God was absolutely complete in himself and had no need for anything outside of himself, created us to know his love. Through story after story of God's loving kindness, his provision, his protection, even his discipline, his invitation to come back, his forgiveness, right to the end.
end of Revelation, which envisions the day when we will be welcomed into God's presence, into his love, to enjoy him forever. We know it. We can celebrate it. We can talk about it. We can anticipate it. We can give thanks for it. We can share it. This is the first truth we learn about God. So simple and so foundational that we teach it to our children when they are still babies, even before they can speak. God is love. And yet it is so deep and complex that really we can scarcely grasp it at all. God is love. We struggle to find words to explain what seems inexplicable until we experience it for ourselves. And so we often wait in silence for God to show up and explain it himself rather than trying to wrestle or struggle to explain it. But what if God is waiting for us to show up? What if God is waiting for us to show up? What if sharing our faith was a four-letter word? And instead of just talking here, instead of just singing about it here together, about God's wonderful love for us, and being a part of a loving community, what if we took that question, how and where does the love of God show up in my life? What if we took that question and we share those experiences inside of these doors and we loved and we just loved not as in all warm and fuzzy but we demonstrated our love for people by listening by sharing ourselves by welcoming them into our circle, by giving them our time, by showing our genuine interest in what they are telling us, by being attentive to what matters to them, by showing care, by supporting, by showing up when they need help. Because remember, love is not passive, it's active. Love is always on the move. The love of Jesus is active, it's a verb, as Bob Goff reminds us in that great book title of his, Love Does. Love Does. That's what happened that day in Bethany outside the tomb. The story of Lazarus, dead man walking. It was the miracle to top all the other miracles. Until Jesus traded places with Lazarus. And with you and with me. So go and tell. Go and love. Thanks be to God.